This video is part two in a two-part series. You can watch part one by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. Defeat at the Taku Forts was a wake-up call to the Western powers. In spite of still being riven by civil war, the Qing were able to inflict a crushing blow against an advanced British flotilla. The Chinese were clearly modernizing. If the Allies didn't act soon, the Chinese might become powerful enough to resist any attempts to enforce Tianjin, and possibly even free themselves from the unequal treaties entirely. But the Chinese weren't that strong yet. The Allies had one more chance to bring the Opium Wars to a victorious end. A truly remarkable force was gathered to accomplish this. Britain and France provided the bulk of the expedition's forces, but their large colonial empires allowed them to bring auxiliaries from across the world. Algerians from Africa and Sikhs from India were particularly prominent. There were even native Chinese serving the force as porters. Men from the intelligentsia joined the expedition as well, including a French scholar and a zoologist sent to study political economy and the local fauna. Elgin would once again accompany the expedition as its chief diplomat. He even joined in on the biological fun by reading Darwin's Origin of Species on the campaign, a work he would later describe as audacious. Elgin would also be assisted by fellow plenipotentiary Harry Parks, who was the very same commissioner of Canton responsible for starting this whole war. And finally, always unable to resist a good war, many journalists accompanied the expedition to report on its happenings firsthand. On March 8, 1860, a final ultimatum was sent to the Chinese government, demanding they allow British ambassadors into Peking. The Chinese reply arrived a month later. Not only did they answer no, but they also chastised the Allies for not showing China greater respect, but did mention that they would be willing to re-enter negotiations anyway. This was more or less the response they were expecting, so the final campaign of the last Opium War was about to begin, one that will lead both sides to the very limits of desperation and depravity. But before we find out how bad it gets, let me tell you about this video's sponsor. Our supporters on the Call Me Ezekiel Patreon. It's because of our patrons that we're able to release a fully illustrated documentary like this one every two weeks, and make each one better than the last. So help us continue to create and improve our content by clicking the link in the description and becoming a supporter. All of our patrons get rewards in proportion to their level of support, including a special role on our Discord server commensurate with your tier, and access to private chat rooms where you'll have direct access to me and our other supporters, adding a country ball to the group shot featured at the end of each video, getting your name into the credits, possibly with extra pizzazz at higher support levels, as well as getting additional country balls put into the group shot, and finally, and only for our biggest supporters, I'll read your name out loud at the end of every video. This channel is only possible because of our supporters, so it would make me so happy for you to join them. Even a few dollars a month can make a huge difference. The links to our Patreon and other options to support us like crypto are in the description. Thank you for your support. And now, back to the video. The first order of business was house cleaning. The British purchased Kowloon from a local official and captured Chusan without a fight. Meanwhile, the French secured the surrender of Shanghai, whose capitulation was motivated by a preference for foreign occupation over that of the approaching Taiping rebels. So with those matters settled, the expedition could begin in earnest. On July 26, troops landed eight miles north of the Taku forts and proceeded to take the city of Baitang. The city's people tried to greet the expedition as liberators, but the men of the expedition chose to repay their hospitality with merciless looting and mass atrocities. The provost marshals, who were supposed to be keeping the men in line, were among some of the worst offenders. It was also around this time that tensions between the British and French troops revealed themselves. Both sides insisted on camping separately, and would not allow their supposed allies to cross between the camps without good reason. A reconnaissance in force was then sent to the Taku forts. They discovered the presence of a Chinese army supported by Mongol cavalry. In the ensuing skirmish, the British got to test their brand new Armstrong gun for the first time, which performed extremely well. 
victory in this Battle of Sinnoh cleared the way to the Taku Forts, but not before the first in a series of strange, savage incidents occurred that would come to characterize this final campaign of the Opium Wars. You see, right after the First Battle of Sinnoh, an Irish sergeant drunkenly mistook enemy Mongol cavalry for allied Sikhs, leading his men right into their clutches. Their Mongolian captors ordered the prisoners to perform the kowtow, all of whom complied except for one private Moisey, who was immediately beheaded as punishment. The rest would be released without incident and relayed this story back to the camp. The expedition's journalists were quick to send the story back to Britain. In the eyes of the public, Moisey came off as a hero and the Chinese as savages, although most retellings of the story leave out the fact that Moisey was almost certainly drunk at the time. After Sinnoh came the Third Battle of the Taku Forts. The Chinese had no special ruse prepared this time, so the battle was decided at the Northern Fort, where gunboats from the south and artillery from the north pounded it hard. At one point, the fort's powder magazine detonated. Finally, infantry were sent forward to capture the Northern Fort by assault. When they broke inside, the party encountered a gruesome scene. It turned out that the fort's garrison had been locked in from the outside forcing them to fight to the death. As a result, the Allied artillery had painted the fort red with the gore of its trapped defenders. The loss of the northern fort forced the remaining forts to surrender, allowing the Allies to proceed up the Piho River. Infantry were carried aboard the ships, while cavalry rode alongside each of the riverbanks. As the expedition sailed up the Piho, they were approached by Chinese officials claiming to have full plenipotentiary powers to end the conflict. Elgin offered them his terms, which included a formal apology from China for the losses they inflicted at the Second Battle of the Taku Forts, a doubling of reparation payments, the reaffirming of the Treaty of Tianjin, the right for the expedition to remain in Tianjin and the Taku Forts, which controlled Peking's access to food, and finally, for a direct audience with the Emperor. Interestingly, there was no specific demand to place ambassadors in Peking, which was, in theory, the whole goal of this expedition. This was because the civil war was going so badly for the Qing that the Allies feared any further humiliations could destroy the dynasty entirely. Nonetheless, the terms were still too much for the supposed Chinese plenipotentiary, who suddenly claimed that he did not in fact have the power to agree to anything. As a result, the expedition continued on to Peking, with many concluding that the talks were just a delaying tactic on the part of the Chinese. Another pair of negotiators would arrive soon after, this time with much better credentials, a cousin of the emperor and the president of the board of war. But aware of the possibility that this was another delaying tactic, the expedition continued to march during the talks. This time, it was Harry Parks who would represent the British. He seemed to achieve much more success than Elgin, convincing the Chinese to accede to every one of his demands, including the right for Elgin and 2,000 men to enter Peking where they would sign the final treaty. This sudden acquiescence sparked an argument inside of the Allied camp. Some thought the expedition being so close to the capital had finally shocked the Chinese into understanding the situation. Others feared that it was just another delaying tactic, or even worse, a trap. Part of Parks' agreement with the Chinese was that the Allied army would encamp at a place called Tung Cho before moving into Peking. But the Chinese suddenly came back later and informed him that the expedition would have to instead bivouac at another location called Chang Chai Wan. But the Chinese cavalry was already spotted in that position. Meanwhile, other expedition forces reported being fired on by Chinese troops. The whole expedition halted to figure out what was going on. Amidst all the chaos, Parks and his entourage had yet to return to the expedition. When he heard about the outbreak of fighting, he found Chinese officials who agreed to take him to the commander of the Chinese army to talk through the situation. But as soon as Parks reached the general's camp, he and all of his followers were arrested. Parks and the other prisoners were brought before a Manchu general, who ordered the plenipotentiary kowtow in front of him. Parks sternly refused, reminding the general that he had been promised safe conduct. The general responded by having Parks' head repeatedly slammed against the ground in a violent facsimile of the kowtow, 
all the while berating him for his intransigence. This flagrant violation of international law and most religious codes was ended by the sounds of distant gunfire, which forced the general to leave to command his troops. Parks and his entourage were then carted off to a prison in Peking. It didn't take long before news of Parks' imprisonment reached the expedition, which confirmed that the Chinese really were springing a trap. After a moment of hesitation, the British and French commanders agreed to surge forward, crush the Chinese army at Chang Chai Wan, and liberate Parks and the other prisoners. The Chinese infantry was hopelessly outmatched by expedition forces, so they were kept back to man fortifications and guard the artillery. The Mongol cavalry, however, was still dangerous, and outnumbered the expedition many times over on its own. Supported by dozens of cannons, the Mongol cavalry fanned out to attack the expedition's flanks, but the Allies quickly deployed their own artillery and battered them from a distance. This disorganized the Mongols, who were then countercharged by Allied cavalry, sending them into a rout. The now exposed Chinese infantry and artillery were forced to withdraw along with them but they would continue to suffer many casualties as the Allied artillery continued to fire into the retreating forces. Chang Chai Wan was a crushing expedition victory, coming at the mere cost of one dead and 18 wounded. The Chinese lost 600 men and were forced to abandon 75 of their guns. The city of Chang Chai Wan itself was then brutally sacked by the expedition. There would be another battle between the French and Chinese over a bridge at Pali Chao but it went much the same way as Chang Chai Wan, with the Chinese cavalry driven off and battered on the retreat by French artillery. The Chinese capital of Peking and the end of the war were now in sight. The defeat of his army the last line of defense between the expedition and Peking forced the Chinese emperor to flee his capital. When word of his flight got out, the city entered a panic, but the expedition did not take advantage by attacking Peking right away. Instead, the British and French armies marched separately around the city with plans to meet at the emperor's summer palace on the other side. But the French rushed forward to reach the palace first and so get the best looting. Contrary to Allied expectations, and aside from some poorly armed eunuchs, there was no resistance to be found at the Summer Palace. Instead, the expedition was confronted by one of the greatest concentrations of wealth and luxury in all of human history. The Summer Palace was not a single building, but rather a multi-palace complex, practically a private city built entirely for the Emperor's enjoyment. Every inch of the complex's gardens and palaces was decorated by the finest art, precious metals, priceless artifacts, and luxury goods from around the world, including many of Western manufacture. It also served as the home for many of the emperor's concubines. The sight of so much unguarded wealth was too much for the expedition to handle. They had no choice but to immediately begin looting it. Lord Elgin was disgusted by the vandalism of this important cultural center, but his attention was more focused on the pressing matter of rescuing Parks and the other prisoners. The Chinese had tried to convince Parks to write a letter to the expedition asking them to give softer terms. He refused to do this at first, but later relented after his captors significantly improved his conditions. But that didn't stop Parks from sneaking in a message at the end written in Hindustani, which he knew Elgin could read but that the Chinese could not informing Elgin that the letter was written under duress, but that he was still alive. The Chinese would eventually let Parks go on the 8th of October, which was good timing because orders from the fleeing emperor to execute him would arrive shortly after. But the war still wasn't over yet. The Chinese hadn't yet surrendered, nor had they released all of their prisoners. The Allies prepared a final assault on Peking, giving the Chinese until midday on October 13th to open the city gates. Five minutes before the ultimatum expired, the Chinese complied. The Second Opium War was about to end, but not before one last horrific scene. Parks had not been treated too terribly during his captivity, but the remaining prisoners, especially the enlisted men, were treated in the most appalling manner possible. They got first-hand experience in the fine art of Chinese torture. Many had their hands bound so tightly and for so long that they turned black and swelled from the pressure, sometimes even bursting. 
The dead flesh would soon develop maggots, who would eat the men alive. At another point, the prisoners were forced to kneel in the summer palace courtyard for days without any food or water. Fifteen would perish from the treatment, one French, four British, and ten Sikhs. The entire expedition was outraged when they found out what had happened. All demanded punishment and revenge. The only question was how. As one of the expedition's generals remembered the mood, could we have had our way, every Mandarin in Peking would have been strung up. The British and French both agreed to demand more in reparations, but that was too base of a punishment to stand on its own. The Allies had to do something symbolic, to make clear to the world that imprisoning ambassadors and torturing prisoners was unacceptable. It was Elgin's opinion that the responsibility for these atrocities could only fall on the Emperor. To destroy Peking, as some suggested, would be to punish China as a whole. It was their capital city, not just the Emperor's. But there was a private possession of the Emperor that could be destroyed. His favorite residence, which the expedition was looting at that very moment. The Summer Palace had to burn. In one final round of looting, several more hidden treasures were discovered. These included a Pekingese dog who was given to Queen Victoria as a gift. It would soon become one of the dog-loving queen's favorite, going by the name of Ludi. So leave a dog emoji in the comments to celebrate the arrival of the first ever Pekingese dog in England, Ludi. But that's for a happier time. Because on the 18th of October, 1860, as punishment for his recalcitrance in abiding by his treaties, violations of international law protecting ambassadors, and atrocities committed against prisoners of war, the Emperor's Summer Palace was systemically demolished and burned, destroying one of the greatest wonders of the modern world. After the Summer Palace's destruction, the expedition entered the capital in triumph. Whereas the French were the first to the Summer Palace, the British were the first to the Peking Victory Parade. This got slightly more embarrassing when they found out that the Chinese did not believe the French to be an allied nation, but rather a mercenary force in the British employ. Elgin was carried into the city escorted by 500 men, as 2,000 more troops lined the streets around him. Such a procession through the capital was supposed to be reserved only for the Emperor. The Convention of Peking was then signed by the highest ranking official still in the city, the Emperor's younger brother, Prince Gan. The treaty reaffirmed the original Treaty of Tianjin, with the added clauses of opening the city of Tianjin to foreign trade, ceding Hong Kong to the British in perpetuity, forcing the Chinese emperor to issue an official apology to Britain and France, reaffirming that ambassadors would be allowed to take up residence inside the city of Peking, introducing full religious freedom to China, allowing foreign missionaries to preach wherever they pleased, and finally, extracting more reparation payments for the Chinese, far in excess of anything they could have reasonably paid. Just like last time, the Russians took this opportunity to take more of Siberia, gaining territory all the way up to the Sea of Japan. This new land is where the Russians would build their Pacific port city of Vladivostok, literally translated, the ruler of the East. And with that, the Second Opium War is over for the Westerners. But back in Peking, a power struggle was about to begin. When the Qing Emperor fled the capital, he was accompanied by and isolated with his most militant advisors. They wanted China's number one priority to be avenging itself against the foreigners. But back in the capital, Prince Gong disagreed with this policy. China was still in the middle of a civil war. How could the Qing possibly take on global powers with their own people rising up against them? Gong proposed appeasing the foreign powers until defeating the rebels and regaining their strength. He even suggested allying with the foreigners against the rebels. The Russians had already offered to send a fleet of gunboats to help the dynasty. But Gong, probably correctly, only agreed to accept material aid from the Russians, and no ships, fearing that such a fleet could easily be turned against the dynasty. Then, on August 22nd, 1861, his brother, the 30-year-old emperor, died, never having returned to the capital. 
To the Chinese, who put a high value on long life, the death of a young emperor was an ill omen. His successor was supposed to be his five-year-old son, but a child could not rule China. A power struggle for real control began. Shortly before the emperor's death, he supposedly signed a document establishing his hawkish advisors as regents until his son came of age. This made Prince Gong into a target for the new regents, whose power he stood in the way of. But he quickly gained two new allies in the struggle. They were China's two empresses, the former emperor's widow and the new emperor's mother. They were totally different people, because the young emperor was not the child of the former emperor's wife, but of his concubine Soi Shi. These two women were in possession of the imperial seals, without which no act of government could be legitimate. Prince Gong and the two empresses used this power to veto the regent's actions and buy time for their own conspiracy to remove them. When everything was ready, they publicly accused the regents of having committed treason. They claimed that the Second Opium War was their fault, because they had misadvised the emperor about the foreigners, that it was their fault that the Summer Palace was destroyed, because they were the ones who had treacherously kidnapped and abused Harry Parks and the other prisoners. They accused the regents of holding the emperor prisoner after he fled the capital by not allowing him to return to Peking. And finally, they even accused the regents of faking the edict granting them their regency in the first place. Five of the regents were stripped of their titles and exiled to the west, while the three ringleaders were publicly executed. And, to complete the coup, in the same edict arresting the regents, Soi Shi, in the voice of her reigning son, granted herself the power to in-person administer the government and be assisted by a counselor or counselors to be chosen from among the princes of the highest order and immediately allied to the throne, effectively seizing the empire of China for herself. And so, because of the Second Opium War, a bankrupt, internationally humiliated, and civil war ravaged China came to be ruled by a woman, the Empress Dowager Si Shi. And that's the Second Opium War. This video was funded by veterans of the Second Opium War, with their loot taken from the Summer Palace, including G.S. Rogers, Josiah, Peter, and the Union of X. Links to where you can join them in supporting our channel are in the description. Like, comment, and subscribe for more. I'll see you in the next one.